hoax today. The, the, the deer skinning activity at the father-son camp out is actually tentative. It depends on somebody actually has to kill a deer. Uh, that's not always a given. It's a hunter's joke. Only a few people laugh at that. Um, amen. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the elders and the staff are, are on their way to West Virginia for a retreat. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that leaves you with me. For, uh, for this morning, but um, we're going to continue in our study of, of, of the book of Mark. We're going to be in chapter 7, starting in verse 24, if you'd like to start turning there. Uh, the, up on the peninsula, they're actually a little bit ahead of us in their study of Mark. So I, I preached this exact lesson last week uh, up there. Um, and some of you were there for like a golf tournament and some other things. So, you know, I apologize. You're going to kind of hear you know, the same sermon that you heard before, but look, let, let's face it, uh, I forgot half of what I said, uh, and you probably forgot all of what I said, um, so it's, it's going to be, it's going to be just like a, like a brand new sermon. You might be asking yourselves, why would James Eilenfeld just randomly look for a job in New England? Oh, well, there's a girl, there's a girl, right? Mm. I mean, that, that's why all men work, is, is for girls. So it's been a, it's been a particularly good summer for James. Um, he landed a new job and uh, convinced some nice young lady to be his girlfriend. So good for you, James. Good. This is your time. Amen. Um, so as I said, we're going to be in uh, uh, Mark 7, starting in verse 24. And, and if you remember what uh, Alex preached on last week, he, he preached on the everything in chapter 7 up to this point. <clears throat> and, and if you recall, it's this setting where the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law or the scribes are challenging Jesus and, uh, and his disciples on, on washing their hands before they eat. Uh, so these these, uh, these ritual, ritual cleansings that they did uh, that, uh, that, that Alex pointed out, that, that, that these, these weren't really biblical commands. These were, these were traditions that had sort of evolved over time, uh, but, but in the, particularly in the Pharisaical mind, these were, these were very important. These, 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 were, these were part of being pure. These were part of being clean. This was, this was what part of being righteous, you see. And, and Jow, uh, Jesus pushes back on that, and he, he explains to them, uh, ultimately, even, even sort of getting into the realm of food, by, by saying it's not what goes into a person's body, but rather um, what comes out of, of the heart. And, and that's Alex spent the majority of his lessons sort of preaching on that, the sin that comes out of our heart. That is what defiles us. So the, the passage that we're going to read today is best thought of, I think, as Jesus having taught, have it, having taught on clean and unclean, he now goes and illustrates his teaching. And so what we're going to read today, you can think of as an illustration of his teaching. Je Jesus will, you will see him throughout the Bible. Uh, Mark, Mark chapter 4, uh, the, uh, the parable of the sower. He, he gives the parable to the crowds, and then he takes his disciples aside and sort of explains it on, on a deeper level. Similarly here, he's, he's taking this teaching that he gave, and now he's actually illustrating it uh, in, in action. So uh, let's just start by reading, if, we sh if, if, if that's okay. Uh, verse 24 <clears throat> of Mark chapter 7 it says, Jesus left that place and went to the village of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. 
Amen. This is a very familiar passage um, in the Bible. Uh, we remember passages in the Bible for particular reasons. Certain things will grab us. And this is the passage where you're like, you know, Jesus said, what? He, he called that woman, what? Um, and you know, we try to reason through, you know, what are, what are, what are some of the reasons why um, you know, Jesus might, might have done that. But as I said, he's, he's teaching. He's teaching. You think of this as a teaching moment. Jesus is with his disciples. He's in a house, and, he, and he's illustrating his teachings on clean versus unclean. You see, after having this debate with the Pharisees and the scribes in the previous section, he now goes to Tyre, it says in verse 1, or verse 24, rather. It's, it's up north. It's, it's outside of, of Jewish territory. There, there are no Israelites up there. So, so Jesus has kind of gone to an unclean place filled with unclean people, you might say, as far as, as, far as a, a Jew would think. Um, and, and, and he meets this woman, and, and Mark uh, tells us that, that the woman is Greek. And, and um, if, that's in, the NIV translates that word to Greek. Uh, some other translations just say Gentile, but, but Greek is actually the better translation. The word, the word Gentile uh, translates from the Greek word, word ethnikos, which is where we get the word ethnicity, and in the, to the Jewish mind, there's the Jewish ethnicity, and then all other ethnicities are, are Gentiles. There's Jews, and there's everybody else. Um, but that's not the word that Mark uses. Mark uses the word Hellenist, which literally means Greek woman. So, so yes, she's a Gentile in that she's not a Jew, but very specifically, she's a Greek, and it's very important that we understand sort of the history of of the Greeks and the Jews um, in, in, in the time leading up to the New Testament. We don't know a lot about the Greeks and the Greek Empire from our Bible because the Greeks had their time between our Old Testament ending and our New Testament beginning. We always have these bad guys in the Bible, uh, enemies of the Jews. Throughout the, the New Testament, it's always the Romans. Uh, from beginning to end. Throughout the Old Testament, you've got, a, you've got a revolving cast. You've got the Egyptians and the Midianites, Philistines, Aramaeans, Assyrians, Babylonians. Um, but, but the Greeks, we don't really hear about because they're in this intertestamental period. When the Old Testament ends, the Persians are in, in charge. The Persians have come in. They've taken over the known world. And, and the Persians were actually pretty good to the Jews as far as tyrants go. Um, after all, we learn about you know, in, in Nehemiah, it was the Persian king that said, no, no, go back. Go back to Je Jerusalem. Rebuild your city. Rebuild your temple. Uh, make sacrifices to your God. You know, honor your festivals. Go do these things. The, the Persians were very hands-off as far as that goes. But the Greeks, the, the Greeks came in, and it, under Alexander the Great, the Greeks come sweeping to the east, and, and they, 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 they take over the known world at the time. They conquer the Persians. They, they make it all the way into, you know, what is modern, you know, northern India, essentially. And, 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 but then Alexander the Great dies very young, and his kingdom, his empire gets divided into four smaller kingdoms, each one ruled by one of his generals. And one of these, one of these four kingdoms was the Seleucid Empire, and it included... Israel, the, the land of Palestine, where, where the Jewish people lived at the time. And again, this is all taking place between your Old and New Testament. The Greeks were very different than the Persians. The Greeks were not tolerant at all of other, of other cultures. Um, they, they, they wanted everybody to be Greek. They wanted everyone to speak Greek. They wanted everyone to worship the Greek gods and, and follow the Greek customs. Um, and they... they they persecuted the Jews because the Jews weren't really into other cultures. The Jews, the, Jews, the Jews believed that they had been sent into exile in Babylon because of their idolatry. You see, all through the Old Testament, you read of the Jews having problems with idolatry, worshiping other gods. The prophets are railing against it. And then they ultimately end up in exile. They get to come back from exile, and they think, okay, we cannot make that mistake again. We have to hold to our traditions, hold to our culture, hold to our ways. And you can, you can kind of understand how this starts to get entrenched. You see, it's almost like they have a post-traumatic stress from the, from, the, from the exile, and they're like, we are not going to let that happen again. The, the, the Greeks 
persecuted them. This, you can read about this. this is, there's historical, you read the book of Maccabees. It's, it's Jewish chronicles of history. The, the, the Greeks came into the Jewish temple, which Gentiles are not supposed to be in the temples. They came into the temple. They sacrificed unclean animals on, on the altar. They'd sacrificed pigs on the altar of God. This is an affront to the Jews and, and their way of worshiping. Uh, they brought prostitutes into the temple and, and did what you do with prostitutes in the temple because that's, after all, how the pagans worshipped. There would always be this kind of thing. They outlawed circumcision. There's a story in the book of Maccabees where they, they bring in two women who have circumcised their sons against the law, and they, they, they parade them around the city to, to humiliate them and shame them, and then they throw them off the wall of the city, kill them. There's a story of, 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 of Jews hiding in a cave on the Sabbath because worshiping on the Sabbath was against the, 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 the laws that the, that the Greeks had put in place. And, and one of their own people betrayed them to the Greeks and the Greeks show up and the Jews won't defend themselves because after all, it's the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. Defending yourself would be working on the Sabbath. And they end up getting rounded up and burnt alive. See, and these are, this is the, this, these are the heroes of the, this is, these are the heroes of the Jewish people. You see, this is in their history books, right? But by, by Jesus' time, this was all a matter of record, you see. There's stories of, of people being brought in and tortured, but being told, hey, if you just eat this pork, which of course was unclean to the Jews, if you just eat this pork, we'll stop torturing you and let you go. But there's these, these, these men are held up as heroes because they refuse to do that, and, they, and rather they, they chose to die. Than to, than to violate their customs, violate their laws, you see. And, and these are the heroes of, of, of the Jews, you see. So you can imagine when Jesus comes along and says, ah, Sabbath, Sabbath for man, not, not man for the Sabbath, and this blows the Pharisaical mind. You're, you're, this is like pure blasphemy not, not against our people. Don't, don't, don't you know the stories of our forefathers who sacrificed and died, and now you want to blaspheme the Sabbath when he says, food, you know, it's not what goes into your body, it's what comes out. Don't you know that our fathers and mothers were killed out of their purity? See, are you, and, and it's not just that Jesus was sort of challenging their religious beliefs, but he was, like a, he was acting like a traitor, you see. Then Paul comes along. Circumcision, outward circumcision is nothing, he says. It's like, ugh, haven't you read the stories, Paul, about the women who were killed? Like, are, are, are you a traitor to your own people? And even Paul would go on and say, there is no Jew nor Greek. What in the world? I mean, after all, you know, when you get when you get buried in ideology, sometimes what defines you is what you're not, just as much as what you think you are. I mean, these guys were breaking down cultural and religious barriers, uh, and and it was not going well, <laughs> you see, for them. And it, but, but you could kind of understand how the, how the Pharisees and how, the, how the, the teachers of the law would, would react so viscerally to this, you see. He, 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 the, the, you know, Jesus and later Paul were, were, were kind of cutting right into the very core of, of, of their identity, you see. We, we, all, we all have a righteousness, that, 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 that we seek. We, we all have this, wh whether it be a story of the past, maybe you're, maybe you're a red-blooded American nationalist and you know, like if, if, if somebody speaks ill, did my mic just go out? I think the, the, the sound people are nationalists and they love George Washington, they cut me off. But it's like, you, like don't speak evil, evil of George Washington or, may, or maybe, it, maybe it's some other thing that you plug into if it's not, if it's not that. You know, whatever it is, right? You and 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 um, and uh, we we have these on at a group level, and we have it as an, at an individual level. We're all seeking our own righteousness, whether it be your career, whether it be the neighborhood you live in, whether it be the schools that you send your your kids to, uh, the size of your bank account, your profession. You know, and, and we we teach our children this. When I was young, I was taught, you know, my generation, the, 
the greed generation. We were, it's like, you got, you go to school, work hard, get a good education, get a good job. Um, and, and the phrase was, my, I can't tell you how many times my dad told me this, is, and then you'll have it made. You'll have it made. You'll be something. You'll be worthwhile. You, people won't point at you and talk behind your back when you walk down the street. You'll, he didn't use this word, but you'll be righteous. You see, there's nothing wrong with working, going to school, getting an education, contributing to society. But, but to think that that earns me something like righteousness, well, that's idolatry, you see. You know, Paul talks about this, again, with the Jews in Romans chapter 10. Um, just read it real quick if I can get to it. It says, uh, he says, talking about the Jews, he says, verse 3 of chapter 10, since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own. You see, they did not submit to God's righteousness. I remember being a, uh, a, 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 I grew up in a rural area, small school, and, and this was in a place and during a time when, when if you're a young man, you have to play sports or else there is no or else, right? And, uh, you know, so every boy is out there trying to find his place and around, you know, puberty, middle school, the, the wheat and the chaff separate and it starts to become clear who's going to make it and who's not. And I was in the, you know, it was the, the big three, football, basketball, and baseball. I didn't have it. I could, I, lack of coordination, not really good at throwing, not really good at catching, uh, too slow to play a skill position in football, too small to be on the line. And I, I, just, I mean, seriously, existential angst. Um, but but my, my school had a, we didn't have a, a wrestling team for, for elementary and middle school, but th there was a high school wrestling team. So when I got to high school, it's, it's like, well, all the talented kids are playing basketball in the winter, so maybe you can find your way onto the wrestling team, you know? And the bar was lower, and I, I get onto the wrestling team, and I had some talent for wrestling, and I, I didn't enjoy wrestling. It was hard. I couldn't eat. Um, I mean, it was brutal and gruesome. I did it for four years because I had to have a righteousness. I had to have something so that I could be somebody. And I'm, look, I'm all for sports. I learned a lot of good things in sports. But, but, for, but to need a sport to be somebody, it's idolatry. You see, it's idolatry. And, and, and the problem with this, you see, <clears throat> is that these idols keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, Jesus came in Mark 1 and said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. And among other things, repenting means forsake your self-righteousness or wherever it is you're getting your righteousness. Forsake this and, and believe. You know, Paul said in Romans 1, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Give me a second while I find that. Verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. He says it is, it is in the gospel that we have righteousness, the righteousness of God. There is no other righteousness. So when Jesus comes and talks to the Pharisees, you know, the Pharisees and, and these cleanliness laws and all of these different rules that they followed, nobody followed the rules as well as the Pharisees. They, weren't, they were good at what they did. And, and people looked up to them. And they were renowned for their purity. And then Jesus comes along and says, like, purity, it, I mean, it's great that you wash your hands. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not righteousness, you see. Righteousness is in the kingdom. 
There's only, Christ is righteous. God is righteous. You, you can, if you will let go of your own righteousness, you can enter into my righteousness. And the Pharisees are like, under no circumstances are we going to let go of our righteousness. We have a lot invested in this righteousness. We've worked hard for this. People look up to us. What would we be if we let go of our righteousness? To the, to the teachers of the law, to the scribes, nobody knew the scriptures like they did. They had devoted their lives to learning, their script, to learning the scriptures and, and interpreting the scriptures. And people, look up, people looked up to them. People came to them and wanted counsel from them. They were important. And Jesus comes along and says, that's wonderful. But, but it doesn't make you righteous. You see, I, I am the scriptures. I am the word of God. I am the beginning and the end of all of that. If you can let go of your self-righteousness, bring your learning, because I can use learned people in my kingdom, but you're, it's my righteousness that you're looking for, not your own righteousness. No, we're not going to let go of that. We have devoted our lives to this. We deserve to be in the kingdom for all that we have done. And Jesus says, no, you have to stand outside the kingdom because your righteousness has no place in the kingdom. In Matthew 7, verse 20, <clears throat> verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You know, these, these, these people in Matthew chapter 7, they're saying, hey, hey, Jesus, we did what you said to do. Let us in. Jesus is like, no, you've developed a righteousness, you see. You, you, you are self-righteous. You think you've earned your way into the kingdom of heaven. Your righteousness has no place in the kingdom of heaven. I, I don't know you. You see, we, this, this, this phrase, I don't know you, I kind of always kind of, what does he mean he doesn't know them? You know, doesn't Jesus know everybody? And I, th I think of it like a, I've given this illustration recently in the past, and it, it caused, I got, a lot, I got rebuked for it, but I'm going to do it again. Um, you know, uh, you know a, a, a man and a woman, a man and a woman, they meet. Man, man, man takes a shine to the young lady, and oh, I want to be around this young lady. Oh, I'm going to ask her, oh, she's going on a date. Oh, I can't believe this. She would go on a date with me. He's, he's overcome with gratitude and, you know, un, um, undeservedness and imposter syndrome, you see, and it, it, it moves on, and oh, oh, now she's my girlfriend, and he's just overcome with, 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 uh, with, with joy and gratitude, and just, and now they're engaged, <gasps> oh, oh, oh. and it goes on, oh, no, will you, and, and now they're married, and it's just, a, just joy upon joy upon joy of this thing that I don't deserve, this goodness that I have not earned the grace of this woman <laughs> to give her love to me. But sadly, this doesn't apply to anybody in here, but sometimes, after a while, you know, the Bible says we should keep no record of wrongs. Sometimes in, in, in a marriage, it's just as bad to keep a record of rights. He says, I've emptied the dishwasher the last three times. And on and on and on and on and on. And, and eventually, you, you lose your sense of gratitude. You lose your sense of undeserved grace. You lose your sense of, 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 of awe at being part of something as amazing as a marriage. And you start feeling like, you start, like a sense of entitlement builds up. You start grumbling, start complaining. And then one day, your wife looks at you and says, I don't recognize you. I don't, I don't even know who you are anymore. You know, I think that's what Jesus is saying to these people. You know, there was a time when you were filled with gratitude that you could be under the grace of God, and yet now you've become entitled. You think you've worked your way into the kingdom of heaven, 
You have a self-righteousness that can't come in. You have to stand outside, you see. Luke 13, similar passage. <clears throat> Verse 23, someone asked him, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? And he said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow gate, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then he will say, we ate and drank. Then, then, then you will say, we ate and drank with you. And you taught in our streets, but he will reply, I don't know you, nor where you come from, away from me, all you evildoers. These people were saying, hey, we were where we were supposed to be. We went to church. Sometimes we didn't want to, but we went anyway, Jesus. We went to the midweeks. We went to the Bible talks. We went to the potlucks. Didn't want to go to a potluck. <laughs> but I went, Jesus. Now open up. Let me in. Jesus said, No. You, you think you're you think you, 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 you think you've sacrificed to the point of some level of righteousness that now has earned you entrance into the kingdom of heaven? Your pride stays outside, and if you hold to it, then you stay outside with it. You know, this passage says, uh, 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 in the NIV, says, make every effort to enter the, the narrow door. Make every, some, some translations say, strive to enter this narrow door. And we read these passages to one another as we're, as we're looking to convict each other. And we say, are you, are you making every effort? You know, I mean, you study the Bible with people. Are you, are you really, you think you're, think you're good with God? Are you striving? Are you really striving? And you, of course, we want them to be like, oh, no, I haven't, no, I haven't, I'm not striving enough. And we, 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 we can mess up here, brothers and sisters, because we can send people out to work harder, and, but, but they have it in their mind, oh, I have to work harder, then I will somehow be worthy to get through the narrow door. And that's self-righteousness that we're building up in one another. You see, this idea of entering through the narrow door, imagine a small door that you have to squeeze into. It's like the, the, like the camel through the eye of the needle. It's the same principle. You can get a camel through an eye of a needle, but it's going to be really hard on the camel. And you can get yourself through the narrow door, but it's going to be really hard on you. You're going to have to let go of a lot of stuff, a lot of pride, a lot of self-righteousness, a lot of self-centeredness, a lot of self-pity, a lot of self-exaltation. You see, you're going to have to let go of your sense of pride that comes from your accomplishments your, your, your good works, your, your, your hurts, your bitterness. We can feel just as self-righteous over that as well. You want to hold on to that stuff? You stand outside the gate. You see. <clears throat> you know, the problem with, with, with this self-righteousness, it, it, it keeps us outside the kingdom of heaven, as I've, as I've tried to illustrate, but it, it, it's, it's also very divisive. We end up in a world where everyone has decided that they'll be God. Because we all have a righteousness of our own. That's the problem, you see. We have competing righteousnesses. And the way the world tends to deal with this, you see, the way the world goes for this, the way the world tries to fix this is the world says, okay, we all just need to gather together and honor one another's self-righteousness. Yeah. I will honor your self-righteousness, and, 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 and I will empathize with your self-righteousness, and you can honor and empathize with my self-righteousness, and then we can make some sort of a compromise, you see, and we can compromise, and you compromise, and, I, and, and, then, and then we can together move forward in some kind of, you know, co 
God leader, uh, a co-God unity. Because the last, like the greatest sin in the world, the worst sin you can commit from the point of view of the world is to challenge somebody's self-righteousness. <clears throat> but see, that can't work in the kingdom. Because the, the prescription for unity, according to the Bible, is found in Philippians 2. Verse 5, it says, in your relationships with, with one another, we've been talking about that a lot. Relationships, one another, right here it is. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Well, what was that mindset, you ask? Well, Paul goes on and tells us. Verse 6, who, Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, you see, Jesus, Jesus on the cross, Jesus on the cross, there's, picture it, there's no pride, there's no place, there's no self-respect, there's no Jew, there's no Greek. This is Jesus on, Paul says, have this mindset. You know, there is no division in the kingdom of heaven. If you're experiencing division in your relationships, if we are experiencing division, that means we're not in the kingdom. If you would like to enter the kingdom where there is no division, make yourself nothing. Be willing to leave it all outside the gate. You see, Jesus is calling us to repent. He is calling us to repent. In the book of Mark, he says in chapter 1, repent for the, and believe the good news, for the kingdom of heaven is near. We, repentance allows us into the kingdom. Repent, enter the kingdom. Repent and believe. And, 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 and in Matthew, he does something very similar. He says the same thing in Matthew chapter 4. But, but in Matthew, after, after chapter 4, it goes into chapter 5, where Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount. And, and I think the best way to conceptualize that is having, having proclaimed the kingdom. The kingdom is here. The king is here. You're invited to enter the kingdom. Now listen to the Sermon on the Mount, because this is how it goes in the kingdom. This is how it works in the kingdom. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Very first words out of Jesus' mouth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who's in the kingdom? The poor in spirit are in, in the kingdom. It do, he does not start off the Sermon on the Mount by saying, Blessed are the churchgoers. Blessed are the hard workers. Blessed are the big givers. Blessed are the baptized. I believe everything about baptism that you do, but if you've attached some sense of pride or entitlement or deservedness to your baptism, well, now you've just made an idol out of it. You cling to your baptism, but check your pride, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Poor in spirit. Which brings us to this woman, for those of you that have forgotten what we started talking about. <laughs> this woman, she comes to Jesus. She's a, this Greek woman. And, I mean, talk about poor in spirit. It's like her daughter is possessed by a demon. You know, we don't know anything about this woman. We don't know what kind of access she had to professional exorcist. We don't know what sort of, we don't know if she had a religion of her own. We don't know if she had money, but, but whatever it was that she had, we have to assume that she had used it all up. 
and, and, and she, she, she had nothing. She could do nothing. And she comes to this Jewish rabbi. And in, in, in Matthew's account, Matthew 15, you have a parallel story of this, of this, this, this story, this woman. And, and in, that, in that passage, she goes to him and says, have mercy on me. You see, and that's, that's beggar language. You know, that's, how, that's how beggars asked for alms. You know, kind sir, have mercy on me. You, you are in an exalted state. You, you have and I have nothing. You, 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 are, you are doing well. I am, I, am, I am in poverty. Have mercy on me. And this, that's what this woman says to Jesus. Jesus, have mercy on me. <clears throat> and Jesus' response It's not good to give the children's bread to dogs. He calls her a dog, you see. And now, look, in in the next chapter, Jesus is going to feed 5,000 Gentiles. Jesus Jesus doesn't have a problem with helping Gentiles, Greeks no less. He's teaching his disciples. This is all for his disciples. And in Matthew 15's account, the disciples are not getting it because they're like, yeah, Jesus, tell her to go away. That's what they say. Like this this Greek woman, Jesus, this Greek woman, we know the enmity between our people. We know what her ancestors did to our ancestors. Yeah, they had the upper hand back then, but now look, Jesus, the tables are turned. Now she's the one in need. Now she's the one lowly. Now get her out of here, Jesus. She's a dog. And that's what Jesus says to her. And you might imagine how you would respond to that, being called a dog or, or pick your name. Not many of us would respond very well to that at all. Her response is, Lord. She calls him Lord. She's the only person in the book of Mark that calls Jesus Lord. Jesus will sometimes refer to himself as Lord. Peter, of course, calls him the Messiah. But she's the only, she calls him Lord. You see, Lord. I am poor in spirit. I deserve nothing. Just let me lay under the table with the dogs. Whatever falls... I'll take it. Poverty of spirit. I've earned nothing. I deserve nothing. And Jesus' response to that, you see, he says, Lord, just let me lay under the table. Jesus says, for that response, you see, for that very response, because of the way you responded, you see, for that response, Because of that, go home. The demon has left your daughter. You see, there's no no demons in the kingdom of heaven. Demons can't get in. The demon left that woman's daughter because the woman entered the kingdom. She's the first citizen of the kingdom of heaven, if you ask me. The first one illustrated in the book of Mark is true poverty of spirit. Jesus is saying, disciples, are you looking at this? This is your example. This is who you should follow. This is who you need to be like, you see. <clears throat> you know, we, we too, if we're disciples, we too have said, Jesus is Lord. Presumably at your baptism, maybe we have, a, we have two or three songs we sing at every baptism. Maybe, maybe at yours, they, we sing, you know, the, the world behind me, the cross before me. On the cross, your cross, there will be no pride. There, Jesus on the cross, he, he goes from God to the most humiliating thing you can imagine. A, a, a criminal being butchered publicly. Are you, are you still up for that? Is that still where you, the world behind you, the cross before you? 
Or have you, have we taken up possessions? Have we taken up treasures? Have, have, we, have we taken up ideologies? Have we taken up false self-worshipping religious practices that are keeping us standing outside the gates of the kingdom? Brothers, sisters, if that's the case, the call of Jesus is the same today as it was yesterday. Repent and believe. Let this be a time in our study of the book of Mark where we, like, see with the newest of eyes, realize that this kingdom stuff is a whole heck of a lot real, a whole heck of a lot more deep, a whole heck of a lot more like right here, right now, than we ever anticipated before. And, and let us repent, brothers and sisters. Let us dive headlong into the righteousness of God, forsaking all false beliefs that we have a righteousness of our own. And let us worship the one true source of righteousness, which is Christ. To him be the glory. Amen. Thank you.